Well, the first Sunday of a new year, you always wonder, well, what should I preach about? And one of them, subject that's kind of become a staple over the years. I know some of you have already got it going in your minds. We're going to talk about tithing and giving and how you need to give more and you need to tithe regularly. But we're not. Okay? I think you guys are pretty generous as it is. You're doing good. Just keep doing what you're doing. What we're going to talk about this morning is how are we doing at loving people. It's an important issue. And in fact, I've entitled the message, Do You Know God? Now a lot of you, you probably all of you say, Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know God, I love Jesus. But what is the litmus test for knowing God? What, what does the Bible say is the ultimate measure of how well you know God. And Michael just read it for us. I'll read it again here. 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, I have to warn you here, uh, we often tend to do a little mental gymnastics when we read that verse. And we read God is love, but mentally we think love is God. Two totally different things. See? Love may or not may or may not be godly, but God is love. So we're going to take a look this morning and see what that love is supposed to look like. And uh, we're we're here in in First uh, John, and John, of course, is known as the apostle of love. So we're going right to an expert to learn what love is all about. This sort of begs the question. What is love? If God is love, and we're talking about God's love now, see, as Christians, we are supposed to be sharing God's love with people, uh, not whatever we think love might be. So, so what is love? Uh, is, is love a, a nice feeling? Is it something that draws us to a, a particular person, such, such as our love for our, our husband or our wife or our children? Uh, is that love? Well, no. That's a, a facet of love, but that's not God's love. You see, we tend to think of love as something that always makes us feel good. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, we need to understand that it was love that put Jesus on the cross. You say, well, how can that be? It was those hateful Romans that put Jesus on the cross. Well, they carried out the deed, but it was God's love that put Jesus on that cross. For God so loved us that he sent his son to go through that excruciating, hellish experience so that we might have eternal life. You see, Love, oftentimes, doesn't feel good. It's easy to love, or to think we are loving, when it feels good. It's difficult to love when it hurts. But that's how God loves us. That's God's love. If we were to look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32, we read these words. He, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. That's what love does. And then back to John, 1 John here, verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. Now, we could amend that sentence a little bit and to say God sent his only son into the world to be crucified so that we might have eternal life. That's what God's love looks like. That's huge. I think that's so much bigger than how we usually define love 
or how we usually express love. The Bible says a lot about love. And there's a, a, a lot of places we could go uh, with this message. But we're going to try to look at just a few little things here. We're going to look at a few of the what I think, and you are free to think differently, but what I think are some of the major aspects of God's love. But before we look at those, we have a couple more questions to answer, and the one that comes up is, well, just who are we supposed to love? And I think most of you have the verse right in your head, where we're told plainly, who are we supposed to love? Remember when, when Jesus in the Gospels, when the Pharisees were trying to trap him, and they, they said to him, well, well, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus respond? You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And that's good. We like that part. But then he says, and the second is this, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. That's a little more difficult, isn't it? Yes, it is. So who are we to love? We're to love all those we come in contact with. Now, obviously, we're, we're beginning to define love a little bit. We're, everybody we come in contact with, we're not going to throw our arms around them and give them a big kiss, are we? That's not the kind of love we're talking about here. We're talking about God's love, and we're going to continue to unfold that for us. So, how are we supposed to love? Okay, we know what we're supposed to do if we know God, we're to love. We know whom we're supposed to love. We're to love all those that we come in contact with. Well, how are we supposed to do that then? Here's a little definition of God's love for you. Love is always acting in the best interest of the object loved. Okay. Love is always acting in the best interest of the lo object loved. So, that's what we do. We, we seek to discover what it is this person needs, what it is, what void in their life maybe we can fill, uh, how we can help them out. And, of course, what is the greatest need of all of those we meet that don't know Jesus? To come to know Jesus Christ. We must see how God acts toward us and then act that way towards others. Okay. Now let me give you my famous disclaimer that I all too often have to give you guys, to my great shame. You know, I don't always act in love towards everybody like I should. You know, I'm working on it. And I hope you're working on it too. Uh, but we're, we're going to be reminded today of, of some of these things we are to be doing. So what are some of the attributes of God's love and how do we live them out in a practical way? See, knowing doesn't do us much good if we don't put it, that knowledge into action. So we're just going to look at uh, four attributes of God's love. And my challenge for you this year is to put them into action in your everyday life. Okay? Now that may look a little different for different ones of us. Because these are attributes, and they're not pinpointed, defined. So let's look at them. And, and like I say, I just chose these because I think they are uh, probably the major four facets of God's love. And the first is grace. Okay, God's love is seen in God's grace. If it weren't for God's grace, all the rest of it would fall apart. You see? We're, we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, you know, verse, verse 8, that by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So grace is a gift. Now I want to define grace for you, and there's a, a simple little definition that's been around for years that I think is a good one. Grace is giving what is not merited. Grace is giving what is not merited. Okay? That's what God's love looks like. See, our love is always conditional. 
isn't it? We like to talk about it being unconditional, but it's not. It never is. Our love is always, in one way or another, predicated on whether that person merits that love whether they treat us appropriately or whether they meet our expectations or whatever it is, we always have that going on with us because we aren't God. But God's love, God's grace, is totally unmerited. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we'll get a little, little flavor for this. It says this, But God shows His love to us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. You see, God moved first. While we were lost and dead in our sins, God moved. So, so grace takes the initiative. Back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, He chose us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. Before we had ever done anything good or bad. God chose us to bestow His grace on us, to make us the objects of His love, even though we were yet to do all the stupid things we've all done. Because it's unmerited. God chose us in Christ. See, that's how God can look at us now and see us as holy and blameless before Him because He sees us as in Christ. We are righteous and blameless before God because the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. What a deal. In love, God sent His Son. In love, Jesus sacrificed Himself. All to give us something that was not only undeserved, but we were completely incapable of ever achieving it by ourselves, regardless of how hard we try. Now you hear people say, God helps those that help themselves. By the way, that's not in the Bible. But that's a nice little saying. But I don't think that's correct. God helps those that can't help themselves. That's the condition we were in. We were, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's such a simple illustration. What can a dead person do? Nothing. They're dead. And that's the way we were. And God in His grace made us alive through Jesus Christ. So grace is the giving of something to someone who doesn't merit it. It's just because you love them, you're giving them this thing. The second attribute I see in God's love is mercy. In um, Ephesians here again, chapter 2, verses 1, 4 and 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Now, mercy is sort of the flip side of grace. Grace is giving someone something they don't deserve. Mercy is not giving someone what they do deserve. Okay. You see the difference? If you're a criminal and you come before uh, Mr. Dodds over there in the court and uh, the guy says, I'm guilty, and Mike says, well, I can give you 20 years, but I'm going to have mercy on you and give you five. See, the guy deserved the 20 according to statute. But Mike, being the merciful man he is, gave him five. Now, we deserve the death penalty, right? The wages of sin is death, Romans. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there we were, deserving of the death penalty, and God says, I am going to show mercy on you 
and you will never die. That's a pretty good deal. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's great. That's good news. And not only have we received mercy, but we continue to receive mercy. You know, in Hebrews 4, chapter 16, it says that when we are in need, we can come boldly before the throne of God, knowing that we will receive mercy and find grace according to the need of the moment. Okay. So many people live their lives thinking that, you know, if I, I can't come to God because if I come to God, He's going to beat me up, He's going to punish me, He's going to give me what I've got coming to me. And nothing is further from the truth. It's just the opposite. God says, if you come to me as my child, you can come boldly. Now that doesn't mean presumptuously, I don't think. But we can come with the confidence that we're going to receive grace and mercy according to the need of the moment. Now, since we're receiving these things, what did Jesus say about things we receive from God. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 he said, Freely you have received, freely give. So God gave us these things unconditionally with no strings attached. Now we're supposed to give those things to others. So that means we're supposed to be gracious to the people we don't like. Now, I grant you that's hard to do, but we don't like them. But God freely gave us grace. Now we're supposed to freely give it away. It's hard to be merciful with some people. And, but God was merciful with us, so he says freely give mercy to other people. So, we have grace, we have mercy. The next one... And we don't often think of this in relation to God's love, as an attribute of God's love. But I, I think it absolutely is. And that is commitment. Now when you think about God's love, or as you've thought of God's love in the past, did you ever think of commitment? Probably not. But I think it absolutely is. In Hebrews 13, 5, what does he say? He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now you could write on if you wanted, no matter what you do, no matter how you insult me, no matter how you turn your back on me, no matter how many times you do that same stupid sin again and again and again, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a commitment to us. I don't think you can say you love without making a commitment. This is truly amazing to me that God feels this way about us. God who is perfect, who is holy and pure, has committed himself to us who are so fickle and so flawed. Why would he do that? That's God's love. How can he do that? Because his commitment is not based on our behavior. It is based in his love for us. And in 2 Timothy 2.13, he says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And you need to know that because oftentimes we are faithless, aren't we? And we don't trust God like we should and we don't do the things we know we should do and we, we do the things we shouldn't do. God says if you're faithless so be it but I remain faithful. That's amazing. That's amazing and I love Paul's list in, in Romans uh, chapter 8 verses 38-39. The list actually starts sooner but 
you know, people want to say sometimes that, well, you know, God will go with you so far, and then when you cross over the line, you lose your salvation. Or the, they have this other one that yeah, the church denomination I was raised in used to like to say. They say, well, no, uh, you can't, God will never let you out of his, his hand, but you can take yourself out of his hand. Well, that's silly. You think about it. Who's that put in charge? Are you more powerful than God? Are you going to be the one that makes God out to be a liar? I don't think so. But here's, here's a kind of a laundry list that Paul gives. And I, I love this. This is good. He says, For I am, and this next word is important, Paul doesn't think, he doesn't suppose, he is sure. Okay? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, didn't he cover everything there? I think so. Because it's God that's committed himself to us. Now, another thing <clears throat> that group like to say is, well, that, that's just giving everybody a license to sin. You can go and live any way you want to live and still be a Christian. Yes, you can. That's true. But here's the deal. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your heart. And the Holy Spirit now constrains you. And yes, you can do anything you want and still go to heaven if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And therefore, you probably won't. Your desire, your deepest desire, will be to please God. And so you will, in many ways. God's commitment to us never changes, regardless of our circumstances, our attitude, our failures to live up to his standards. He never changes. Hebrews 13.8 lays it out there. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. See, our love is fickle, even with the best of us. You know, it, it waxes and wanes, and the way we feel waxes and wanes, and, and goes in and out and around about, and, but not Christ. He says, I loved you. I loved you. I knew you before the foundation of the earth. I selected you to be my child. And now I'm going to keep you. And so he will. So do we reflect this attitude in our commitments? I don't know. Only you know. You know, cause we, and we have commitments at various levels. You know, probably the highest commitment we have is to our spouse. And then the next is to our children. And then uh, the next is probably to our, I would hope, to our church. And then to our, our employer. You know, and all those things down the line. Employees, if you happen to be the employer. Are we committed to these people? I hope so. And finally... It's another attribute of God's love that we sometimes don't think of in how we're going to, at least not practically speaking in our lives, because we don't like it. Or at least we don't understand it, so therefore we don't like it. And that is the word sacrifice. So we have grace, we have mercy, we have commitment, and we have sacrifice. What's the number one verse memorized around the world? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. But we got, we've got to think, he, he gave his only begotten son for what? To die is what he gave him for. Ultimately, to be born, to live a short life, and die on a cross, a horrible death, so that we might have eternal life because God so loved us. Now, 
God asks that we give our lives for him. Okay, Romans 12.1 I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and blameless, acceptable before the Lord. There's a bit of a double standard here, though. When Christ gave his life a sacrifice for us, it involved literally dying a torturous death. When he asks us to give our lives a sacrifice for him, he says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. I think we've got the best end of that deal. You see? Jesus died sacrificially. He asked us to live sacrificially. Because if you're going to live the Christian life and you're going to love as God loved, it's going to require sacrifice from time to time. You know, believe me, I understand how hard it is to be gracious and merciful to those people you don't like, you don't think they deserve it. But God says, be sacrificial. So what do we have to sacrifice? Well, sometimes we have to sacrifice our pride, our egos. Uh, you know, why don't we like certain people? We don't like them because uh, they step on our ego or they cause us problems or, you know. You've got to set all that aside if you're going to love as God loved. He asks us to live sacrificially. Every, every morning, every Sunday morning anyway, I pray with the worship team. And usually, I say something to the effect of, God, I'm so thankful for these people that give sacrificially of their time and their talents to help us come into your presence. You see, they sacrifice their time, they sacrifice their talents, and, and sacrifice in this sense doesn't mean they don't still have them. But they spend time rehearsing, practicing, you know, learning new songs, all that sort of thing. And then they come down here extra early on Sunday and do it all again just for us. Okay. That's the kind of living sacrifice God's talking about. Now, it can come in many forms. One of them, it may come in, in financial form where you, you need to give. Uh, it may come in the form of using your time. Uh, it, there's just a lot of different ways it comes. But it means, basically, that we're taking something God has given us. Time, talent, treasure, that's kind of the three T's of the thing. And we're giving that away. And how does God give when he gives? He gives lavishly. He gives abundantly. I uh, was reading in the Colombian a couple days ago and on the opinion page and <clears throat> Dana Melbeck has a column in there and I don't always read it but I, something caught my eye about it that day and it, it's, it was actually a new word for me but uh, evidently it's not one he coined because it was in my computer's spell check so, but it was new for me and he was talking about what he sees as one of the major problems in our nation today as that of the lack of the willingness to actually sacrifice something. We want to look like we're sacrificing something. We want to sound like we're sacrificing something, but we don't. And here's, here's just a little snippet from it. And he has called it slacktivism. Okay, slacktivism. A uniquely American form of engagement in which statements are made without any real sacrifice. The slacktivist gets icy water over the head to fight Lou Gehrig's disease. Or tweets out hashtags to fight kidnapping in Nigeria. The slacktivist wears color-coded bracelets for causes. The slacktivist likes causes on Facebook. The, sac the slacktivist sacrifices nothing of his time or treasure. And you know, 
That's so true, isn't it? You know, we do all this symbolic stuff that's totally vacuous. It has no substance. I can tweet all day long about somebody being kidnapped and it doesn't help them. You know, I can pour buckets of water over my head and it doesn't help. But I can offer my time, I can offer my talent, I can offer my treasure, and it might actually help. So, this year, there's your new word, don't be a slacktivist. <laughs> so again, I would ask you, do you know God? John says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. As we move to our communion time, I would encourage you to look back and look ahead. And just ask yourself, how am I doing with sharing God's grace, God's mercy, God's commitment, God's sacrificial love with those I encounter? After all, Jesus himself said, and by the way, John wrote this down in his gospel, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That's huge. That's huge. You know, the first century church uh, grew exponentially. It just exploded. And we, we oftentimes, we historical types, study that and try to figure out, well, what is it they did? Uh, how can we emulate that? Now, the, the third century church father, Tertullian, said they loved one another. And they did such a good job at it that a little later on, the Emperor Julian, the Roman Emperor Julian, who, by the way, is a pagan, he's no friend to Christianity. He put a lot of grief on a lot of Christians. But he commented this. He says, These impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but others, but ours also welcoming them into their love feasts. I think this early church grew because they really practiced God's love and it was visible not and apparent not only to other Christians but to the non-Christians also. Now, I'm sure Julian probably thought it was foolishness but he noted it. He took note. They welcome them into their love feast. So, I would leave you with this question. Are we welcoming people? Now, the word can be used a little differently than we normally think. When Julian mentioned it, they welcome them into their love feast, he didn't mean that when they wandered into the door, everybody was friendly. Now, that's a good thing. But that's not what Julian meant by welcoming. What he meant was they actively invited these people. Okay. So as you go to communion, ask yourself, how many people did I actually invite into our presence this last year? I don't know. You know? If they're non-Christian, it's easy to invite them. If they're a Christian that used to go to church somewhere, it's easy to invite them. Yeah. So, make this a year of welcoming people into our fellowship so that we can love on them and they can love on us. Because if all we have is our little Parkside group, we're limiting ourselves. And God says to go out in the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Now what does he mean by that? You go out and grab them by the scruff of the neck and drag them in? No. He means make a compelling case so they will want to come. You see. So just think about that as you go about your daily life. How many people are you welcoming each week into our fellowship? I don't know. And I'm... Sure, we can all do better at that. 
But as we think about God's grace, God's mercy, God's commitment, and God's sacrifice, as we take communion, let's not only be thankful for what He has done, but let's be faithful in reflecting what He has done to the community around us. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you did all of these things freely for us. That you gave us grace that we didn't deserve. You withheld punishment that we did deserve. You've committed to us regardless of what we do. And you showed us that you loved us so much you were willing to sacrifice your own life for us. And now, Lord, as we reflect on that, help us to go away from this place with a new resolve to better reflect those attributes to those we come in contact with. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.